Okay. So, um, so welcome back. Um, last time uh, we discussed the role of race and ethnicity in, in health treatments and outcomes and the fact that racism exists and that it has often meaningful, substantial and immoral um, consequences. We discussed a little bit about the causal role of race, if any, uh, in some of the diverse phenomena that could appear with respect to public health. We talked about different ways of distinguishing uh, different kinds of, uh, of racial disparities, ethno-racial disparities. We talked about the role of ethnically patterned patient preferences, the role of physician decision-making and of geography in race-based differences in health. And finally, the difference between bias, uh, stereotyping and uncertainty, which are conceptually and morally different but which can often lead to the same outcome and might even have the same treatment, but make it difficult to know what exactly is going on. Now let's refresh our memory a little bit today about different ways of defining health or of defining medical conditions. This is, I think, the third time we've seen this set of ideas. Uh, one way is a statistical way, which compares people to their peers. Another way is the adaptive way, which compares people to their environment. And the third way is the social way, which confirms, which, can, which compares people to normative ideas. And note that the normative standard is not the same as the normality or statistical standard. When we speak about statistical normality, that's different than uh, social normativity, you know, social norms. And in fact, another way to understand the social standard is to say that illness is socially constructed. Now, the social construction of illness is the opposite of essentialism and of positivism, which see social and biological phenomena as given and measurable entities with a fundamental es essence and which claim that the truth is knowable via the scientific method. So essentialism thinks th things have an essential, uh, uh, fundamental social and biological nature, let's say, and positivism thinks that science is the way to understand that nature. Now, the argument with respect to social construction is that observations about the world are actively and creatively produced by human beings. In other words, the argument about social construction is that knowledge is created, not found. Ideas and actions are made or invented and determined by communal norms and expectations is the kind of vision of social construction. Hence, social forces shape our understanding of and actions towards illness and health. And to the extent that this is the case, then social attributes such as class should also be relevant to how ostensibly objective biological phenomena are seen, taxonomized, understood, and most importantly for today, treated. Moreover, the key fact that our perceptions of bodily processes are socially constructed has implications for patient experience and physician action. And this is the key point of today. And I hope to persuade you today about both the power and insight offered by this perspective of social construction and um, its limitations. So to punch this point home and to motivate our discussion for the day, I thought I would start by considering a related problem. Now here is what should be familiar to all of you, the familiar visual part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we know as light with the familiar rainbow colors. And the colors are on the bottom. And I want to draw your attention to two facts. First, you probably all feel with the possible exception of indigo, that these colors make sense and that they are real colors. There are a certain number of colors you think, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. Those are, you know, the colors that we think of as, as colors. And second, and distinctly, you probably all agree more or less on where the names are placed so that you all see green as ending somewhere here and blue as beginning somewhere there, more
more or less. But there's in fact very little that is objective about both of these claims, about the number of colors we perceive and about the boundaries we draw between them. For example, the number of colors we identify might depend on our attributes, like our sex. But let's look at some experimental results from a large scale worldwide investigation. On the top is a standard set of, set of simuli, stimuli used by the so-called World Color Survey that show a palette of 330 colors. Each of these, these are like paint chips that you might find in a hardware store. There are 330 of them. And what you do is, is you show one of these at a time, separately from all the others, to native speakers around the world. And these investigators did this with 110 different languages in non-industrial societies. So they fanned out around the world. They took these paint chips. They found people in 110 different societies speaking a, an indigenous language. And they showed them one chip at a time and said, what color is this? So you're shown this chip. What color is this? What color is this? What color is this? What color is this? And so on. And the investigators recorded the color term that was assigned to each of the 330 chips by the largest number of speakers for each language. So in other words, if most speakers called this orange, we're going to use the word for orange here. Or if most speakers had called it yellow, we would, we would label that chip with the color of yellow. Maybe not every human being in this society, and they don't all call it orange. Let's say most 80% called it orange. We're going to take the mode, the most frequent response for each color, and now we're going to label the colors in this little grid of uh, whatever it is, uh, 11 by uh, 30 or whatever it is. So we're going to create a modal map, a mode map such as that shown in the lower panel, which is a mode map for the Lele people. Lele is a language that uh, uh, for which there are four major color categories, black, white, yellow, and red. These people divide this color spectrum into four categories and just four categories. Those are the words they have for colors in their language. And the boundaries between the colors are indicated here. These are the reds, these are the blacks, these are the yellows, and these are reds over here um, as well. Now, interestingly, um, uh, there are clear universals and also differences in color naming across societies, such that both the number of recognized colors and the boundaries of the colors vary from place to place. So the recognition of colors is at least partly socially constructed and it transcends the physics of the situation. It's not the physics, the electromagnetic spectrum that's guiding this, it's the society, the culture that is guiding this. So there's a further key point, however, that we're also gonna to explore today, namely that once constructed, such categories can affect the people that hold that construction. These categories can have effects. A very controversial, so, the so-called Whorf hypothesis, which is very controversial and was propounded in the 1950s and also explored in the science fiction movie Arrival, which if you've not seen, you should see. It's a terrific movie. This Whorf hypothesis, W-H-O-R-F, holds that semantic differences between languages induce different differences in the perceptions and or cognitions. In other words, if you come up in a language that has four colors, then you it affects how you see the world. And this idea has a checkered history, but it's been resurrected recently. And so the question would be, do linguistically coded color categories induce actual differences in color discrimination? Here are examples of people who identify just three colors. These are uh, the Awobe of the Ivory Coast, the Bete of the Ivory Coast, and the Ejagum of Nigeria and Cameroon. They have just three colors, white, black, and red. And here are groups of people who identify five colors on totally different continents. These are people in Ecuador and New Guinea, and they partition to have just five colors, but some differences in where they draw the boundaries, although also some commonalities and here are examples of people who identify six colors and where they draw the boundaries. And the blue-green distinction is a key one uh, here. Now, to be clear, the issue is also whether people even see the differences, 
In other words, if you, if you, do you see the difference between shades of green or do the conventions in the society in which you were raised make you fail to distinguish it or fail to see it? In other words, if you grow up in a society that doesn't have different words for green and blue, does that mean when you're shown green and blue, you can't really tell the difference as easily? Um, and in fact, there is some evidence of this exact claim. One study that involved experiments with the gaze of toddlers found that the color discrimination shifted from the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere of the brain once the toddlers acquired terms for the relevant color categories. And so language may influence the functional organization of the brain here with respect to color perception. Similar arguments have been made about sounds such that native speakers of tonal languages such as Chinese may, for example, hear differences that those of us who are not speaking tonal languages don't even hear. So if you grow up Chinese and your whole life depends on being able to tell subtle differences in tone, it changes your mind and it changes your perceptions of the world. And of course, there are always people, artists or musicians, for example, in any society that see or hear more than the rest of us. But that's a different matter than what I'm talking about today. Or consider the work of a, of a, of a linguist by the name of Lyra Boroditsky. Boroditsky uh, and she examined the way the Cook Thayor talk about space. This is an indigenous peoples in Australia. Amazingly, these people, instead of words like right or left or forward or back, which, um, you know, which are commonly used in English to define space relative to an observer, the Cook Thayor, like many other Aboriginal groups, use cardinal direction terms, north, south, east, and west, to define space. And this is done at all scales, which means you have to say something like, there's an ant on your southeast leg, or move the cup to the north, northwest a little bit. One obvious consequence of speaking such a language is that you have to stay oriented at all times or else you cannot speak properly. The normal greeting in Cook Thayor is where are you going? And the answer should be something like south, southeast in the middle distance, according to this ethnographer. Incidentally, there are fascinating experiences that have taken Aboriginal peoples and put them into buildings and walk them through a building uh, without any windows and they can navigate by dead reckoning to get out because their whole mind is focused on changes in direction. They think differently about space, let's say, because they grew up this way than uh, other people. So speakers of languages like the Cook Thayor, um, uh, and in fact, oh yeah, so in fact, there's a profound difference in navig navigational ability and spatial knowledge between speakers of languages that rely primarily on absolute reference frames like the Cook Thayor and languages that rely on relative reference frames like English. And speakers of languages like Cook Thayor are much better than English speakers at staying oriented and keeping track of where they are, even in unfamiliar landscapes or as I said, in unfamiliar buildings. And what enables them in fact, forces them to do this is their language. Having their attention trained in this way equips them to perform navigational feats once thought beyond human capabilities. Now, as linguist Roman Jacobson pointed out, languages differ essentially in what they must convey, but not in what they may convey. Languages can oblige the users to think in particular ways. And because space is such a fundamental domain of thought, differences in how people think about space don't end there. People rely on spatial knowledge to build other more complex, more abstract representations, representations of things like time, for example. So this, this, um, this has been shown uh, that how you think about space and how your language obliges you to think about space in turn affects how you think about time. So if the Cook that you are think differently about space, how can we tell if that's the case with respect to time? Well, Boroditsky had this fantastic idea, which is she gave people sets of pictures that showed some kind of temporal progression. For example, pictures of a man aging or a crocodile growing or a banana being eaten. And the, her respondents, their job was to arrange the shuffled photos on the ground 
showing the temporal order. And she tested each person in two separate sittings, each time facing in a different cardinal direction. Now, if you ask English speakers to do this, they'll arrange the cards so that time proceeds left to right. And how they're oriented in space doesn't matter. If you ask native Hebrew speakers how to do this, many of them will lay it out right to left and which direction they're facing doesn't matter. But if you ask the Kuk Thayor to do it, what do they do? Well, instead of arranging the time from left to right, they arrange it from east to west. That is when they are seated facing south, the cards go left to right. And when they are facing north, the cards go from right to left. And when they're facing east, the cards come toward the body and so on. They spontaneously use this spatial orientation to construct their representations of time. So their language affected their thinking and also their actions. Here's another nice example of how language can affect thought and action. Languages indeed vary and differ widely in the ways they encode time and not just space. For example, they differ in when they require speakers to specify the timing of events and when the timing can be left unsaid. For example, if you wanted to explain to an English speaking colleague why you can't attend a meeting later today, you could not say, I go to seminar. English grammar would oblige you to say, I will go or am going or have to go to a seminar. If on the other hand, you're speaking Mandarin, it would be quite natural for you to omit any marker of future time and say in Chinese, I go listen seminar. In this way, English forces its speakers to habitually divide time between the present and the future in the way that Mandarin, which has no verb tenses, does not. Of course, this does not mean that Mandarin speakers are unable or less able to understand the difference between the present and the future, only that they are not required to attend to it every time that they speak. So economist Keith Chen tested the hypothesis that languages like Chinese that grammatically associate the future with the present foster more future-oriented behavior. The idea is that when you think the future is no different than the present, you treat it and your future self with more respect. You don't discount the future as much. So languages with weak FTR or future time reference save more money and behave better towards their future selves and vice versa. And he found in fact that speakers with such weak FTR languages save more, retire with more wealth, smoke less, practice safer sex, and are less obese. And this holds acro across both countries and within countries when uh, comparing demographically similar households. So here he shows the average total savings rate by country and the light bar countries speak weak FTR languages and the dark bar countries speak strong FTR languages. Those are like R, like English, for example. And he finds that on average, countries which speak strong FTR languages save substantially less, as if the way of speaking with which you are encultured affects how you see the world and how you act in a variety of ways. Language frames perception and action. Now, something like all these ideas is at work in medicine. Let's start today with plastic surgery. Whether you judge a nose to be in need of medical attention depends usually not on the objective reality, but rather on social norms. Now, I forgot what percentage, uh, hold on, I didn't put it in this figure here. Let me just quickly look one second. So 4% of you thought that a large nose was a medical problem and 5% of you thought it was a concern of doctors. Yet we all know that rhinoplasty is a nose surgery, nose jobs, is a huge business in the United States. 500,000 people every year seek evaluation and 250,000 people have nose jobs every year. We have 14 million plastic surgery procedures every year in the United States, spend over $10 billion on this, depending on what counts. So our perceptions influence medical practice. Our construction of what counts as a nice nose influences medical practice. Here's another young woman that also wanted her nose uh, adjusted from this shape to this other shape uh, subsequently. 
And this boy is so much happier about his ears. So before he had these ears that, you know, some kids get teased, you know, they have Mickey Mouse ears or they get called wing nut, you know, for the, their ears are out like this. And he had a procedure known as a setback otoplasty. I used to sit in on procedures like this when I was a medical student with a very famous uh, uh, plastic surgeon by the name of John Mulliken, uh, a procedure where you kind of tack the ears back. And, uh, and this boy, as you can see, is much happier afterwards uh, with his ear procedure. We construct our ideas about what our body should be like. We see them in particular ways and we apply medical technologies accordingly. Today, however, we're gonna be examining this idea of social construction, mostly through the lens of women's health and Emily Martin's magnificent book. And I should stress that this is not restricted to women's health issues, though that is a particularly rich example. Now, this is a typical diagram of the menstrual cycle probably familiar to all of you from high school biology. The endometrial lining undergoes cyclic uh, regeneration. It's illustrated here at the bottom. The endometrium proliferates initially under the influence of rising uh, estrogen. Here is the development of the egg. A mature egg is released. Uh, and then you have a consequent rise in progesterone, the ongoing proliferation of the endometrial lining, you know, ready to, if this egg is, uh, is in semen, is uh, fertilized with sperm, then it implants and progesterone says hi, otherwise progesterone drops and the endometrial lining, you know, is degraded uh, as shown here on the right-hand side. So the endometrium proliferates initially under the influence of estrogen. And once ovulation occurs, the ovary then starts to produce progesterone, which changes the proliferative pattern of the endometrium to a more secretory lining. And in time, the secretory lining provides a hospitable environment to one or more fertilized eggs. If no egg is detected, the progesterone level drops and the tissue and blood that constitute it uh, exit the vagina over a series of days. Here is one textbook definition of menstruation, which I'm gonna to read to you now. The sudden lack of these two hormones, estrogen and progesterone, causes the blood vessels of the endometrium to become spastic so that blood flow to the surface layers of the endometrium almost ceases. As a result, much of the endometrial tissue dies and sloughs into the uterine cavity. Then small amounts of blood ooze from the denuded endometrial wall, causing a blood loss of about 50 milliliters during the next few days. The sloughed endometrial tissue plus the blood and much serous exudate from the denuded uterine surface, altogether called the menstruum, is gradually expelled by intermittent contractions of the uterine muscle for about three to five days. This process is called menstruation. This is the typical description of menstruation that are in countless textbooks and that no doubt all of you have read about at some point or another repeatedly during your education. But note all the decay and failure. This is lack, spastic, ceases, dying, sloughing, oozing, denuding, more loss and more sloughing and more denuding and more expulsion, right? These are all loaded words. They are words we bring to the biology of the situation and contrast this with a process of failed reproduction in men. So, because men also you know, produce a lot of sperm that doesn't go on to fertilize anything. The mechanisms which guide the remarkable cellular transformation from the spermatid to mature sperm remain uncertain. Perhaps the most amazing characteristic of spermatogenesis is its sheer magnitude. Sounds very masculine too, right? The normal human male may manufacture several hundred million sperm per day. Wow. Isn't that amazing? What an incredible accomplishment of, this, of, of these men uh, doing this thing. Note here that there's no discussion about the waste of sperm or spillage or sloughing or failed reproduction, right? None of that is, appears in this description of uh, an analogous male biological process. And, and contrast this with a similar but not identical physiologic process that occurs in both male and female bodies. This is the renewal of the gastric epithelium. The primary function of the gastric secretions is to begin the digestion of proteins. Unfortunately though, the wall of the stomach is itself constructed mainly of smooth muscle, which itself is mainly protein. Therefore, the surface of the stomach must be exceptionally well protected at all times against its own digestion. The function is performed mainly by mucus that is secreted in great abundance 
in all parts of the stomach. The entire surface of the stomach is covered by a layer of very small mucus cells, which themselves are composed almost entirely of mucus. This mucus prevents gastric secretions from ever touching the deeper layers of the stomach wall. Now, the point here is that, is that we see menstruation in a particular way, and we describe it in a particular way. And these two are related, and they are not arbitrary. And as we shall see, such views of bodily processes have implications. Martin criticizes all this, of course, but she goes further. And when I first read this book, I was reading along and I was going, yeah, 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 Emily. Yeah, you know, this is a classic, you know, argument about social construction and about the role of gender in, in perception. And of course, but this is how menstruation actually works. You know, what are you talking about? But then when I first read this book, when I was in medical school 30 years ago, here's what this genius woman did. She provided a physiologically accurate but socially reconstructed way of describing the same phenomenon. Here's Emily Martin's description of menstruation. A drop in the formerly high levels of progesterone and estrogen creates the appropriate environment for reducing the excess layers of endometrial tissue. Constriction of capillary blood vessels causes a lower level of oxygen and nutrients and paves the way for a vigorous production of menstrual fluids. As part of the renewal of the remaining endometrium, the capillaries begin to reopen, contributing some blood and serous fluid to the volume of endometrial material already beginning to flow. The point, of course, is that conditions are judged by a social and normative standard. Whether we see something as pathological can depend on who we are, where we stand, and when we are living. And you showed this yourselves in the exercise that you did for this class. Here are some initial ways that you constructed illness. So none of you thought that a large nose was a disease. Incidentally, this number is now very small. I've been doing this survey for 20 years and this number has been coming down and down. But 5% of you still thought it was a concern of doctors. 0% of you thought that homosexuality is a disease. As probably all of you know, even 20 or 30 years ago, many Americans thought that homosexuality was a disease. 4% of you still thought it was a concern of doctors. 7% of you thought that road rage was a disease. 18% of you thought doctors should do something about road rage. 38% of you thought that PMS was a disease and 67% of you thought that it was a concern of doctors. Now this is politically very dicey, right? Because on the one hand, you want women who are having this bodily experience to be able to have a name for it and seek medical care if they want. On the other hand, many people argue, no, we shouldn't be problematizing the normal functioning of women's bodies. Why should we be labeling this as a disease state? 38% of Yaleys thought that PMS was a disease. 52% of you thought back pain was a disease. 90% thought it was a concern of doctors. I already mentioned in a few lectures ago how rates of back pain vary dramatically across societies in ways that don't seem to have any bearing on what's actually happening in people's bodies. 32% of you thought acne was a disease, 71% doctors, and so on on down the list. 92% thought that anorexia was a disease, and 95% thought it was a concern of doctors. So even though rhinoplasty is one of the most common surgical procedures, you did not consider having a big nose to be a problem, but obesity really hit your radar screens. And as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, some of these conditions such as back pain and anorexia show substantial cross-cultural variation and may be seen as culture-bound syndromes and might not be considered diseases at all elsewhere and indeed might not even exist. Think about that. If we didn't have a culture that said that middle-aged men can have back pain or that teenage girls need to have certain body types, maybe we wouldn't even have these diseases as if the absence of a category suppresses the occurrence of an illness and vice versa. Labels are sometimes applied by physicians, of course, and are the product of expert knowledge. And sometimes these labels are sought by patients. But which definition of health is used has led to contested labels. For example, in PMS and ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder and hay fever, 
three conditions, we see a tension between the social and statistical definitions of health. How can a majority of people be labeled as ill? You know, if most women or, the, or a great minority of women have PMS or a great minority of boys have ADHD or a great minority of, of, of human beings have hay fever, how can we say that's a disease, for example, instead of like normal functioning? And you guys were all over the map in your perceptions about what constituted disease and needed the attention of doctors. So childhood short stature, 23% thought it was a disease uh, and 59% and of uh, doctors. We mentioned PMS already. Color blindness, 44% of you thought that color blindness of a disease. There are several people in this class who, have, who are fully or partially colorblind, I can guess based on the size of the class, and they might or might not have different perceptions. Um, pedophilia, 42% of you thought it was a disease, 47%, however, now that's interesting. You think this serious condition is, is a disease, but only half of you, you know, not many, not many more think that doctors should take care of it. Cocaine overdose, obesity, blindness, hip fracture, and alcoholism. Many of these conditions, there was a lot of, you know, not full consistency in the class regarding whether it's a disease and whether it's a concern of doctors. Now let's, let's take a closer look at one class of phenomena. Um, so here are some phenomena, ingestions I'm calling them. Smoking four packs a day, 42% disease, 86% of doctors, habitual cocaine use, alcoholism, lung cancer, 97% disease, 99%, 100% uh, thought lead poisoning was a concern of doctors, cocaine overdose, a hangover, most of you Yaleys didn't think a Hanover was a disease, and a few of you thought it was a concern of doctors. I'm not gonna comment on that. And a Tylenol overdose. Now, let me just switch out of, if I can here, let me just see if I can uh, stop sharing. And then, uh, now why? Why, uh, let me see if I can, I don't know if I can't, I can't share my screen and see you guys at the same time. So, uh, so you can't see those labels, those, the data anymore. Why do you think there was variation? What might be some reasons you varied in how you assign these? Any thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, cultural. Oh, Jennifer, I'm sorry. yeah. Oh, Maggie, help me manage the questions by calling on people for me, okay? Yeah, I, um, I saw Matt first. Okay, Matt. So maybe for some of them, like the severity is different, like a hangover pretty much is like max one day and then you're over it. Whereas lung cancer uh, could have some more significant consequences. Yeah, so for example, uh, a hangover, 12% of you thought it was a disease, but alcoholism, 75% of you thought it was a disease, right? So you're right, severity affects whether you thought it was a disease and whether you thought it should be a concern of doctors. Uh, more social construction. What other attributes might be relevant? Jennifer? Um, yeah, I was thinking that maybe like if you've had experience with some of these before, like a family member might have had an experience of one of these, like based on your personal perception of your experiences, you might think that it's a disease or not, depending on how you felt or like how you experienced the situation. Very good. So personally, that means like where you're situated socially and you know whether your friends have had it. So for example, even with COVID, we see this right now. Many people think, oh, COVID is just a flu. They're socially constructing COVID. But if one of their family members dies, they're like, oh, no, no, that's a serious condition. It's not just a flu, okay? Yes, keep calling on people, Maggie. Chris. Um, I was gonna say something similar to Jennifer, but like, for example, if like you have ADHD or if you're blind, like you may not, you might not think of that as a disease, but someone who does, doesn't experience that might think of it as a disease because they like, think it's like something like, I guess I'm not sure how I want to phrase it, but yeah, basically like kind of whether or not you have experience with it can make it feel like a, like a good or a bad thing. Yes, that's of course correct. And we'll return to this idea later in the course, that exact idea. But I want to also just remind you that some people who even who have the condition might want it to be labeled a disease as you saw in the autism readings for today. Because if society says you can only get certain services if you are labeled by the medical profession as having a disease, then all of a sudden we're again socially constructing using our political and economic system what is and isn't a disease. Let me just see if I can resume screen sharing now. I don't know if I can do that. Uh, 
I think uh, there's one more hand, Nicholas. All right. Well, while I'll try to listen to that question while I share my screen at the same time. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Kenneth. Uh, no, I don't uh, want to do I, that. I was going to also say perhaps um, one's own uh, views on morality or uh, ethics. So uh, someone might say, "Oh, well, um, alcoholism is more of a you know your personal uh, you know." moral failure uh, what, what I think gambling was another thing on the on the list so one might also yes say that, that's a that's a moral issue rather than a medical issue yes thank you very much uh that's exactly right okay now I have the screen you can now see see the list again and you can see me is that right because I now cannot see you guys okay yes that's right the moral agency seems to matter so and the voluntariness seems to matter, and the acuity seems to matter, and the risk of death seem to matter, and cause and effect seem to matter. You know, smoking versus lung cancer, for example, you have different ideas about whether smoking. So all of these factors go into whether you construct these things as being diseases or not. The social construction issue also touches on the debate about medicalization we discussed a couple of weeks ago, to which we'll return when we discuss Ivan Illich's work. And there's one person who has his hand up right now who should take it down, I think, uh, uh, if he can. Uh, and it's interesting which problems you thought doctors should concern yourself, themselves with and which not. For example, poverty, as we've already seen, kills many more people than hemorrhoids. But you felt that 84% of you thought doctors should concern themselves with hemorrhoids and only 18, I'm sorry, 99% of you thought that doctors should concern themselves with hemorrhoids, but only 53% with poverty. And yet poverty is a leading killer in our society, okay? Uh, and similarly, you know, with other kinds of things, you know, malnutrition, depression, sadness, nuclear war. 12% of you thought nuclear war was a disease and 44% of you thought it should be a concern of doctors. So the social construction of illness leads to medicalization. And this involves, this process involves seeing doctors for progressively less serious conditions, seeing doctors for non-medical conditions or the redefinition of such conditions to be under the purview of doctors or seeing doctors for, the nor for normal parts of the human um, of life experience. So, so we increasingly come to see things. Let me just see where I am here because I've lost track. Oh, here we go. And by some accounts, there's an epidemic of medicalization. There can even be a kind of social iatrogenesis, iatrogenesis, which we'll discuss later in the class. Here's a list of some conditions that have recently been medicalized. We understand all of these things increasingly in medical terms, whereas formerly we understood these things as non-medical problems. So PMS, ADHD symptoms, erectile dysfunction, this used to be seen as something different than a medical problem. Baldness, short stature, acne, infertility, child abuse, substance use, road rage. Many of you thought this was a medical problem. Gambling used to be seen as a moral failing or a criminal problem. Many people now see gambling as a medical problem. Gun violence or even climate change. So medicalization is the progressive annexation of not illness into illness. And as my teacher, sociologist Renee Fox has put it, health and illness have come to symbolize many positively and negatively, negatively valued biological, physical, social, cultural, and metaphysical phenomena. And increasingly, health is seen as a coded way of referring to any ideal state of affairs. I see this in your generation in the, word you use, the way you use the word safety. Safety used to have a very specific meaning about being not at risk for physical injury, but increasingly the word safety is used as a kind of coded way of speaking more generally about an ideal state of affairs in certain ways. Now, incidentally, a demedicalization movement has also arisen, questioning whether objective categories can be deduced about health and disease, and questioning whether if illness is socially constructed after all, why it must be accepted. And recent examples include contestations about autism, as discussed in your readings, and homosexuality, which are two big topics for which the medicalization, demedicalization debate 
has taken place in your lifetimes. And part of this movement has focused on disempowering doctors and empowering patients, giving patients the rights to treatment, a right to privacy, rights to information, rights to life, even rights to death. So part of the debate about whether something should be medicalized or not with, with cross-cutting political agendas is that if we say it's not a medical problem, that means we can take the power away from the doctors and give it back to the patients. So short stature, for example, on the one hand, you might say, oh, we can medicalize it. We can give human growth hormone. That's good, some people might say. Others might say, no, that's bad. There's nothing wrong with being short. Actually, we empower doctors wrongly if we do that. We therefore do not want to medicalize and define that condition. Indeed, more doctors, health organizations, and students are pushing for medical education, for example, to include climate change, saying that physicians and other healthcare workers need to prepare for the risks associated with rising global temperatures. I mentioned poverty a moment ago. Medical schools are pushed to train doctors for climate change. And consider, for example, the epidemic rise in ADHD in the United States in the last 20 years. An estimated 11% of children in the United States have been diagnosed with ADHD at present. Between half and two thirds of those are put on medication. This shows the rate of office-based visits per thousand people in the United States on the, on the y-axis versus time on the x-axis. And look at these boys. I mean, the rate at which they are being diagnosed is, is skyrocketing and the rate at which they are being given a stimulant is skyrocketing across time with also a steady increase in girls. How can it be that we can say that so many boys who are just boys actually have a disease that needs to be medicated, for example? Or even in the last 20 years, the prevalence of use of psychoactive medications in Ivy League students has skyrocketed. At least 20% of Ivy League students are using some kind of psychoactive medication at any given time. This is a very high rate of treatment in what would previously otherwise be seen as a sort of you know, elite group of people in our society. So the question is, is this epidemic of ADHD real? Has something actually changed in the biology and it's gone up, you know, whatever it is, you know, eightfold or tenfold in, in, uh, in a 20 year period in these boys or instead, is it an epidemic of social construction where we redefine certain behaviors to be illnesses and concern of doctors? So we know we redefine homosexuality not to be a disease and we define ADHD to be a disease and we're constantly contesting and redefining what is and is not uh, an illness. And in fact, the United States is an outlier in the number of Ritalin prescriptions given to children and the epidemic would appear to have struck us especially hard which again comports with the idea of social construction. So this shows us uh, standard units in billions in terms of the global supply of ADHD uh, treatment over time. And you can just see the United States rising more rapidly, let's say, than the rest of the world. In your case, I forgot the percentage, uh, what percentage of you thought, let me just quickly look here. For ADHD, you guys put, 61% of you thought it was a, uh, a disease and 79% of you thought it was a concern of doctors. Something similar is happening with autism in all likelihood, where diagnosed cases are rising as disease categories are defined and redefined and contested and, uh, and recontested. And as you saw in your readings, what counts as autism and who gets to say and what it means is contested and socially constructed. And the definitions depend in part on the way of defining health that we saw a few lectures ago. So for example, when we think about the neurodiversity argument and the neurodiversity movement and different conceptual models of, of autism, the statistical standard would compare people to their peers. And autists, unless they're exceptionally high functioning, could be defined as disabled, as diseased, as warranting medical care. If we use the adaptive standard where we compare people to their environment, Autists may have a disease or not, depending on the situation, and they're fit with whatever the environment is, similar to sickle cell trait. I can't remember if I discussed sickle cell trait with you, but just having the sickle cell trait is adaptive if you live in a high malaria zone. So you wouldn't necessarily say that having sickle cell trait is a problem. In fact, it's great if you live in a high malaria area. 
It's only when you live in a different environment outside of a high malaria zone that sickle cell trait might become problematic. This is, for example, the same kind of argument you might use for autism. Or the social standard compares people to normative ideas. And so autists may be seen as merely different with different actors having different views and for different reasons. If you are autistic or your brother or sister are autistic, you might have a rather different perspective on this than, than someone else, let's say. And this matters because seeing autists as simply normal variants might mean no extra services for them, but seeing them as sick might lead to stigmatizing them. So it's not obvious what is the right or moral thing to do if we bring in that layer of analysis as well. And Jarms Manuelen in your readings proposes a, mo propose a model that uses the concept of vulnerability as a way out of this conundrum. How can we get people the services they need without necessarily stigmatizing them and marginalizing them? What is the conceptual way out of it? And so they have one a set of arguments. Now let's return now to childbirth. Uh, I'm trying to look up here up to find a, a pregnancy. Where's pregnancy? Let's see if I can find pregnancy. Uh, I don't know if I have pregnancy here. Uh, what was it? About 12% of you thought pregnancy was a disease state. Amazingly. Uh, I'm, I'm trying not to be judgmental. I'm just trying to report the facts. And 96% of you thought it was a concern of doctors. 8% of you thought birth itself was a disease state. And 93% of you thought it was a concern of doctors. And as Emily Martin argues, notions of production run rife in this event, as in the others she considered. The pituitary gland, for example, produces the hormones FSH and LH. Uh, the ovary produces estrogen and progesterone and eggs. The uterus produces lining and babies, but not menses. That's, you know, that's not what it's supposed to produce. And all the while, hormones and eggs and embryos and babies are being transported from one place to another place in this like bodily machine. And as such, she argues, menstruation and menopause, which is when women stop uh, having their periods when they're in their 50s, let's say, are seen as failures of production. And so those elicit a negative view in our society. In fact, menstruation is not just seen as a failure to produce a baby, but as production gone awry, making products of no use, not to specification, waste. And labor during childbirth can also be seen as failing. A woman may be seen as failing to progress. That's a medical term used by doctors. She is failing to progress is a term that doctors use to describe what's happening during labor. And, as, and, uh, and women can be seen as merely participating in a production process that must be monitored and managed by experts. And this way of seeing the woman's body has consequences. Women become disconnected from their bodies. Their bodies become fragmented, get broken down into parts and into processes, and then doctors intervene. Here's a woman having a baby today, for example. It's the beginning of the procedure. And here we are now. She's having a baby. What, what do you notice about this picture? Anything strike anybody about this picture? Severin. I mean, it looks like um, she's having an operation or surgery. Uh, what makes you say that? Um, like all like the blue sterilization covering and there's like a, a team of doctors there too. And like the IV fluid and everything around there. Okay, other ideas. Danielle. It looks like she's being strapped down. It does look like she's been strapped down, doesn't it? I mean, the fact that her legs are in this position and draped does not mean she's having surgery. Some of that might be for reasons of modesty, let's say, but go on. What, what is the most, what is some strike, another striking feature of this picture? There's one that's so obvious to me. Yes, go on, David? Maggie, keep calling people. Uh, no one's looking at her. Yes, yes, look at that. They're all looking at monitors or away from her, right? She's delivering a baby for God's sakes. So 
this this way of seeing childbirth, all of the things you observed are true. Um, of seeing childbirth in a certain way as one of as one of producing a baby, redirects attention away from what I think actually matters. No one's looking at the woman in labor. Look at how she's draped and covered, as if she's become just another machine producing a product in this room. She's just another piece of equipment, in a way, in this situation. And here's the baby now about uh, to be born, OK? And as Martin points out, this, the delivery process can be mapped as a production process. And this is a different flow diagram than the one in her book, though it's also taken from a medical source. The mere fact that, we are, that there are such flow diagrams is itself um, very interesting, actually, and suggestive. Even the pre-delivery phase has a flow diagram. You know, uh, hold on, you can't see me. Let me just get back to where, let me get my little uh, uh, thing here. How do I get? Here we go, annotate, uh, spotlight, yes. Look, this is the pre-delivery process. Prepare for pregnancy, conception, suspect pregnancy, confirm pregnancy, manage pregnancy, labor and delivery. And then you go to a different subroutine you know, over here. Now you enter the labor and delivery subroutine. You can have a planned vaginal birth or a planned C-section. If you have a planned C-section, you go straight to C-section. But under the planned vaginal birth, you might have spontaneous labor, but there could be then a failure to progress. Then there's augmentation. If it doesn't work, you go to C-section. Or you could have emergent complications. If that happens, you go to C-section. And you could have induced labor, and you could fail to progress, and then you go to C-section. Or you could have emergent complications, and then go to C-section. Basically, the only way you can have a normal birth is to sneak by on the side over here in this flow diagram and get down to a vaginal birth. So note how seemingly tangential normal deliveries are in this flow diagram. So many arrows lead to C-section and so many to failure to progress. Our ideas about what delivery is like, our social construction of this biological experience has implications, lead us to take action, like doing all of the things on this chart precisely because we define concepts like normal labor and failure to progress. And there may be nothing objective at all about any of these landmarks. They may be socially constructed out of thin air with no evidence basis whatsoever. And in fact, many practices that have been widely adopted that I was taught at Harvard Medical School and during my residency at the University of Pennsylvania, I was taught these were the right things to do, were all adopted based on our conceptions of female labor. And actually, when randomized controlled trials were then done to evaluate these procedures, they were all shown to have little or no benefit or even to be harmful. For example, we used to do electronic fetal heart monitoring. Uh, and then there was an RCT that showed that there was no improvement in neurological development in prematurely born children. We used to induce labor. We still do. All of these things are still done, by the way. But this RCT showed only a slight reduction in cesarean sections and no effect on perinatal uh, or neonatal morbidity. The active management of labor, no effect. Monitoring fetal oxygen saturation, no effect, and so on and so forth. All these monitors we put on women's bodies, all these, like, like we have a clipboard with a stopwatch and we're tracking you know, what's happening. This is all socially constructed and it leads us to cut them open and do things to their bodies because of what we have imagined to be the truth of the situation. And contrast all that we have just seen with this idea by reversing the genders. This is Emily Martin again. If your husband was told that he had to get an erection and ejaculate within a certain time, or he'd be castrated, do you think it would be easy? To make it easier, perhaps he could have an IV put into his arm, be kept in one position, have straps placed around his penis, and be told not to move. He could be checked every few minutes. The sheet could be lifted up to see if any progress had been made in what he was told to do. And as Martin at page 58 uh, notes, this strikes us as ridiculous. Yet as she documents, women in labor are often put in structurally analogous circumstances. And I don't mean to exaggerate, 
But stories like this one catch my eye every year. I've been teaching this course for 20 years. Every spring, there's a story like this. Prisons often shackle pregnant inmates in labor. Shawana Nelson, a prisoner at the McPherson unit in Newport, Arkansas, had been in labor for more than 12 hours when she arrived at Newport Hospital on September 20th, 2003. Ms. Nelson, whose legs were shackled together and who had been given nothing stronger than Tylenol all day, begged, according to court papers, to have the shackled removed. This woman is in labor and they shackled her legs together. Though her doctor and two nurses joined in the request, her lawsuit says the guard in charge of her refused. She was shackled all through labor, said Ms. Nelson's lawyer, Kathleen Compton, the doctor who was delivering the baby made them remove the shackles for the actual delivery at the very end. Look at this awful human being. Look at them, all of them, the, the, the wardens, the doctors, the, all of them, it's outrageous. Despite sporadic complaints and occasional lawsuits, the practice of shackling prisoners in labor continues to be relatively common, state legislators and a human rights group say. Only two states, California and Illinois, have uh, laws forbidding the practice. Every year there are cases like this. If any of you have ever seen a woman in labor, you realize how preposterous it is to imagine that a woman delivering a baby is gonna get up and run away or that multiple shackles are required. I mean, this is just a crazy conception of what's going on here. Now I'm a doctor of course, and this stuff is fairly mundane to me. And I've tried to show only tame and reasonably discreet images today, but there are many more pictures in Martin and on the internet that can give you an idea of how mechanized and dehumanized the process can truly be. Here's, here's another example of the consequences uh, of the way we um, construct childbirth. This is, this is a procedure known as an episiotomy. It's an incision that's made in the perineum from the vagina towards the anus during vaginal delivery. So the, that's the head of the baby here. This is the doctor's fingers and she or he puts their fingers through the baby and feels downward between the vagina and the anus. And then these are scissors that are used to cut this part of the body. You can either cut straight down towards the anus, that's called the midline episiotomy, or laterally, that's called the medial lateral uh, episiotomy. An episiotomy was previously believed to prevent tearing of the vagina as well as damage to the pelvic floor. And it became a routine procedure in the United States for nearly a century. Roughly half of American women have this done to them at delivery. But in the past 10 or 20 years, studies have provided strong evidence that postpartum pain is less with spontaneous lacerations, that is with natural tear. Women do tear like this when they deliver a baby, that's indisputable. The question is whether cutting them makes the situation better or worse. And the data have now shown that women have less pain with spontaneous lacerations than with cuts. Studies have also shown that women return to sexual functioning earlier with intact perineums or spontaneous tears compared to women who have had episiotomies. The belief that episiotomy prevents damage to the pelvic floor has not been substantiated. And in fact, midline episiotomy significantly increases the risk of anal sphincter laceration, which then predisposes women to feed incontinence for a substantial period of time. Now, I would suggest but one of the reasons that episiotomy has become so common is that our views of women's bodies as a machine producing a baby, a machine that needed some engineering and modification so that the baby could come out on schedule, right? We see the process of labor as a production, and then we think, ah, we need to flip some switches and push some widgets, and then, oh, then the baby will come out on schedule. And as a result, we have done this useless procedure, or often, not always, mostly useless procedure. Um, and further evidence of the social construction of the need for episiotomy comes from its telling variability. Women who deliver their babies attended by physicians in private practice undergo an episiotomy 67% of the time compared to women attended by hospital faculty physicians who don't get paid for procedures, just draw a salary, who undergo one 18% of the time. In other words, if the doctor can make extra money by cutting you, he or she, and it's mostly she because most gynecologists are now women, will do the procedure, which is another example of uh, social construction. And in fact, there's also large international variation. 
with some wealthy countries having an 8% rate of episiotomy and others a nearly 100% rate. So there's nothing biological about this. This is socially constructed. Of course, even in the developing world, countries, uh, uh, the countries that were um, is sampled in the Barron study that was in your readings, a total of 24.5% of women got a tear. So in these countries where women are delivering children, you know, largely naturally, about a quarter of women get a tear. And, um, and alas, as reported in that study of those women who had a serious tear who had, that had to be surgically repaired, 14% of them had that repair done then without anesthesia, which is another whole topic. Of course, the abuse of women is not limited to modern Western settings. This is a slide taken uh, from your readings for today. During the labor observations, 14% of the 2016 women uh, taken from four countries, I'm, I'm blocking on the name of the countries right now, from around the world. These are mostly developing world countries. I can't remember, Maggie, what were they, Ghana and, you don't have it handy, I don't have it handy. I don't either. Um, so uh, these women, these, um, uh, name, uh, it shows that during the observations of the labor, 14% of the 2000 women experienced some kind of physical abuse. Most commonly, this was being slapped, hit, or punched. So one out of six women while delivering a baby in these developing world settings was physically abused while in labor and 38% experienced verbal abuse. Physical and verbal abuse peaked 30 minutes before birth and lasted until 15 minutes after birth uh, in this situation. So here are the peaks. This is now the baby is delivered here. This shows events per thousand women. This shows time with respect to delivery. And here it is, women are being verbally abused while they're delivering a baby or physically abused while they're delivering a baby in these four non-Western settings. So just as there has been a resurgent interest in natural death in the last 30 years, which we'll talk about in a few lectures, there has been a resurgent interest in natural childbirth. And Martin discusses this at length and you'll find more pictures there. But note the difference between this image and the other one we saw earlier. Everyone here is looking at the laboring woman. She's upright with gravity working with her to get the baby out of her body. And she is in her own home. This is the midwife here catching the baby before it falls on the floor. And this is a, probably a doula or a close personal friend. This is probably the partner of the woman who's keeping a respectful distance, or actually there are two partners, actually two, male, uh, two men. This is probably her partner and this is someone else, maybe her sibling, I don't know. And here is another person. Everyone is looking at her. This is a completely different uh, birth, this natural childbirth. But of course, this is atavistic. Atavistic means a throwback. Uh, and because this has been the mode of delivering babies since time immemorial, okay? So, you know, this is, you know, this type of posture here to deliver babies is what is vastly uh, more typical uh, than, than the posture we put women in uh, today. So our conceptual models affect treatment. And there are many examples outside of women's health, plastic surgery, and mental health uh, that we uh, contributed, that we've discussed so far today. So for example, stress ulcers. When I was in medical school, it was the tail end where we were still being taught that what caused ulcers was stress, that your stomach was producing too much acid. Uh, and that and, 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 and middle-class men who were having stress ulcers were sent home and told to rest for a while or were told to drink milk of magnesia. No, what causes stress ulcers is a bacterium or mostly called Heliobacter pylori. Uh, but our conception of what was the cause affected how we treated this patient. Premature ventricular contractions are extra heartbeats. Uh, they're often seen after heart attacks. When I was a house officer still, and this was in, uh, when was that? That was in the, uh, the early 1990s. We were told, we were taught, this is bad. If patient's heartbeat is irregular after a heart attack, you need to give them a powerful medicine to stop it. Well, this was just because we could, we could see it. We were killing our patients, it turns out, by prescribing these medicines. Or radical mastectomy. Uh, this was a procedure when a woman had breast cancer, her breast was removed, 
and a, the section was done up in her axilla and all the nodes were removed. Sometimes nerves were damaged. So her hand would, would be floppy afterwards or because of the removal of the lymph nodes, the hand would, the whole arm would become edematous. Uh, and it turned out that actually procedures that were less disfiguring that involved lumpectomy and radiation uh, work just as good, if not better. So I would suggest to you that it was our attitudes towards women's bodies or our disrespect for women that prompted the, not just the invention, but the tolerance of this procedure without ever evaluating whether in fact it could have you know, some uh, effect. Or gender reassignment surgery. There's a big debate right now about you know, whether we should or should not perform surgery or other interventions if people feel like they're in the wrong kind of a body. This also touches on the social construction uh, debate. Now, I need to be very clear about something, however, because I don't want you leaving this lecture with a misunderstanding of what I've been saying. It is not the case that modern healthcare is not beneficial and that all we have to do is return to some natural time or place for childbirth. These are some devastating WHO statistics. This shows the maternal mortality by region per a number of women, mothers who die per 100,000 live births. So for example, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, 1,000, nearly 1,000 women per 100,000 live births die. One out of 100 women dies delivering babies. This, is, this may be natural, but it's not good or tolerable, okay? It's very important you not make something known as a naturalistic fallacy, which to, is to assume that just because something is natural, that means, to be, that means that it's good. And if you look around the world, I, I used to have it broken down here. I can't remember if in, in, if in Afghanistan, it's not here on this chart, but in Afghanistan, the rate of maternal mortality in Afghanistan would make you weep uh, what happens in that part of the world. And even in the three sample countries in your reading by Baran, uh, and in the particular sample of facility births, five out of the 2016 women or 250 out of 100,000 actually dial, died in this childbirth, as did 2.3% of their babies. So women and babies die during childbirth. It's as if, in fact, two of you in this class right now just dropped dead right now. That's the prevalence of this condition. So the WHO Safe Motherhood Initiative regarding the provision of basic health care in this domain unfortunately did not have the success it should have had. A certain small percentage of women need serious advanced medical care on short notice. In other words, yes, we need to better support natural childbirth around the world, but some fraction of women and children need high-tech care urgently and should get it. And so the challenge is to separate what is social construction from what is scientifically beneficial. And in a way, the challenge of being a doctor uh, is the challenge of being a doctor is to know when to respond to the statistical, when to the normative, and when to the adaptive standards of health. My point is not to somehow simplify things in a silly way and to say that the fact that things are socially constructed means that there's no science or medicine or to put these concepts into false opposition to each other. You see, they're both true is the problem. It's not easy to know what to do or how to think about these things. These are some of the leading causes of maternal death worldwide. So these are causes of maternal death. Severe bleeding is in about a quarter, infection in 15%, unsafe abortion in 13%, eclampsia, that's a constellation of physiologic derangements in a woman's body where her platelets don't work and her blood pressure is very high, uh, when, which happens in many pregnant women. Obstructed labor, which is just devastating. We have ancient skeletons of women buried with their dead, woman died and baby dies with the head of the baby stuck in the woman's pelvis. Uh, when she's buried, you know, uh, and other direct causes and, and so on. These kinds of problems don't respond to midwives with kits, nor should we define them as non-problems because they're natural, right? Just because women have died this way for centuries, you know, eons, oh, well, they're natural, so we don't need to worry about it. They can indeed be prevented with many low-cost interventions, for example, reducing infections or unsafe abortions, but they're not easy to eliminate. And so what's challenging 
about what I'm telling you today is that things are complex. The Martin critique is one of the best and is spot on in my opinion. But I want to challenge you even more because there is also the reality of maternal and fetal death. What we want is the best of both worlds and it should be possible to have it. And this is what is so hard about being a doctor. You really, you, what you're really trying to do is to integrate what is scientifically sound with what is human. And you don't always know what's right. And information is conditional and tentative and changing all the time. Okay, so we have a couple of, uh, couple of moments to for uh, questions. Any questions from today? Did you learn something? You learned something today, good. That makes me happy. If I were in a classroom, I could see you guys. I could see your eyes, you know, like, oh, wow, that's interesting. Oh, I didn't know that. I can't wait to tell my roommates. This is the other thing that happens is you don't have your roommates, many of you right now. So you can't go back and talk to your roommates about these ideas and be challenged by them. Anyone have any questions or anything else? Yes, Amy. So I was wondering like, if you could find some sort of like ideal balance, like what would you suggest? Like for instance, like doing like a natural gravity kind of thing in a hospital or like? Yes, I mean, if you're asking very narrowly about childbirth per se, yes, you can have these kind of birthing suites with special chairs and you can have a midwife attend to you and a doula and sit up and so on in a hospital. Yes, that would be ideal, but not everyone can have that. But the bigger challenge, of course, is how to handle all these conflicts that we've discussed today, right? Like how to, how, to, how to handle the Martin critique, but also not surrender when we do want the doctors to cut you, right? We don't want them to cut you for arbitrary reasons, but we want them to cut you for the right reasons. So how do we figure that out? It's not easy. It's not easy at all. And we just talked about childbirth. It applies to so many things, right? I mean, yes, I could maybe solve the childbirth, address your childbirth question, but that's just childbirth. What about heart attacks, you know, or, or COVID care, or you pick it. It's all happening all the time in every single medical condition. It's being constructed and it's being, you know, and the biology is being understood. Anyone else questions or comments? Let me scan to the next page here, see some other faces. And I see lots of people whose videos are not on. Remember, we, we do expect you to have your videos on, even though I cannot see you during the lecture. I want Maggie to see you and I want you to see each other. It increases engagement. So I'm seeing Faid and Lorenzo and Brandy and Mir Miraya are not on there. I'm calling you guys out. Uh, and, uh, and now, anyway, whoever else, Molly and Zach and Kai, okay. So, um, all right, so that's it for today. I will see you guys uh, next week and we'll continue. Thank you, see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.